already. Lai Chen, please take it away. Okay, uh, thanks very much for the nice introduction. And uh, thank you for joining today. Um, um, it, it's a pity that I didn't actually have a chance to meet with uh, most of well, all of you in person, but I think that there will be a chance. But it's a, um, I'm very happy um, that um, I have a chance today to, to, dis uh, to give a short talk um, to discuss um, the research that I've been doing um, in the past few years. Um, and um, yeah, I hope um, everybody will enjoy uh, this talk. Okay, so um, many of you have known that, um, some of you have known that I am a galaxy guy. So our professional goal is actually to make the galaxy look great again. Not, not again, but it looks great. So um, although like we, there's a huge amount of uncertainties <laughs> and unknowns on both the theory and uh, observational science, um, but what, we, what if we compare like what we have right, right now to what we have like 10 years ago? And you do notice some difference. Like when you compare uh, the galaxy we produce in the simulations to a real galaxy that we observe, you see that we really are getting closer co to closer to the real images that we observe uh, from a telescope. Now to make the galaxy look real, uh, the most important physics I assume is rate of transfer. The other, in other words, it is the interaction between the light and the matter. And the, the dust, cosmic dust plays key role in the RT processes in the galaxies and thus serve as diligent worker, keep transporting the energy it absorbs from the short wavelength, the UV and the ultraviolet, and the re-emit at far, far infrared and the submillimeter bands. And the interesting consequence is that the detectability or the visibility of a galaxy depends on the wavelength you're observing at, right? So this is a very interesting example that this uh, object discovered, uncovered by a submillimeter telescope in the Hubble Deep Field, but ironically, it has never ever been detected by HST itself. So a long time, we know nothing about this object, only, only until like 10 years ago, for the first time we observed the CO line emission from this object, and through CO spectroscopy, for the first time, we have an idea that this object is as early as Retro 5, within 1 billion years of the Big Bang. The uh, important consequence of this uh, effect is that, um, much of the stellar light in the universe is well absorbed by dust. So in order to constrain the key properties, for instance, how many stars are there and how much star formation is ongoing and has occurred in the past, we have to have a good knowledge of this absorption and re-emission. Um, while we, we want to look into a deep into the sky, like while it is pretty easy uh, with the UV telescope uh, with Hubble Ultra Deep Field, we can go as deep as Retro 10, but does, the far infrared part is actually pretty challenging. That's because the limitation of the telescope, uh, because we know that the resolving power of the telescope depends on the observing wavelength. Now for the HST, we have a much better resolving power, but for as we, uh, especially for those single dish long wavelength telescope, uh, um, we actually cannot resolve things very clearly. Now every telescope has a background noise level and uh, you know, together, with the minimum size that a telescope can resolve, you can convert this background noise to the minimum luminosity you can detect an object at high redshift. So you'll find that actually while uh, HST can detect lots of, resolve a lot of objects as far as redshift 10, but our knowledge of the dust obscured star formation history in the universe is only limited to below like redshift two. So the, don't go panic. So there are actually uh, a number of solutions and uh, the, uh, there are actually, um, yeah, a number of solutions. The first is the UV approach. The idea is that um, basically it depends on the multi-wavelength uh, coverage uh, of the observations that you, you find. And the, through an empirical relationship, you can basically convert, extrapolate the IR luminosity from the UV data. Um, this is something that I'm going to talk about later. And the second approach is the submillimeter uh, approach. So this is uh, a quite new te technique related to the Hama, uh, Alma deep imaging. So it's, it works like uh, X-ray imaging that you get from, from, from a hospital. So imagine that for a dust rich universe, you would expect that given long enough exposure, exposure time, at the end of the day, you will find more bright sources that you can identify in the AMA deep fine imaging. So the idea is just to convert the number source that you find in those imaging uh, to the uh, amount of dust in the early universe. And I also mentioned there are other, uh, actually other approaches, for instance, C2, um, which actually is uh, what I'm working on um, at CDOT right now. Uh, hopefully, some, some uh, not too distant future, I will update uh, you, you guys with, with, with the progress in that uh, direction. But um, 
now, like today, uh, I'm going to basically focus on the first two approaches. So let's move back to solution A, so the so-called IRXB relationship. So what is exactly IRXB? It's actually not, not difficult um, conceptually. So IRX basically is a ratio of, of the IR luminosity, essentially the area enclosed below this uh, uh, far infrared SCD. And this uh, UV um, is, LUV is the UV luminosity here. So beta is essentially the spectral slope that you measure at UV wavelength. And this uh, beta naught is, is when the beta, the slope that you measure when you don't have dust attenuation, uh, this is intrinsic beta. And here, the after dust processing, and you, you'll find the galaxy look redder than this beta that you get. So empirically, I would expect that as I increase the level of dust attenuation, both IRX will, and beta will increase as a result of the energy balance. Right? So this is something um, uh, we know already. So solution B, AMA deep imaging. So this here, I'm showing basically the AMA band pass. Um, at long, usually it covers the long wavelength, a Rayleigh James tail of the submillimeter galaxies. Now the, uh, the idea is that you measure the flux density in the Rayleigh James tail and we want to extrapolate the total infrared luminosity, essentially the area of here. So directly you can immediately, can, you will realize that the uncertainty in this technique is how well we understand the shape of far infrared SCD. So these are actually the two techniques, commonly used techniques to extrapolate dust obscured um, SFR in early universe. Now let's come back to solution A. So what makes things promising is the finding about 20 years ago, like Muir et al, 1999, for the first time reported a tight correlation between IRX and beta using a local sample of Starbucks galaxies. And that makes things very promising because as long as you have a good constraint of UV luminosity, as well as the beta, you have multiple, more than one band coverage uh, at UV, so you measure the slope. So then by applying this empirical well-defined relationship, you can extrapolate IR luminosity of the, of the galaxy at high ratio if you, if you want. The problem is that the things does not work that perfectly all the time. So um, following the, uh, the initial discovery, and that there are some following observations, lots of following observations show that the the scatter or the deviation of this relationship is, is quite large, as actually not trivial. Um, so when you extend the sample uh, from just a local starburst to like heterogeneous, with, which means that it has a more uh, diverse star forming history uh, and covers a larger range of pressure, then you find that the dispersion, the scatter of this relation is pretty large. And um, especially the Eulers, uh, the extremely infrared luminous objects, they actually lie systematic above this canonical relationship. It's something we don't actually understand well. And the second, of course, the discovery, which is also very significant, is um, in the, like a few years ago, uh, this is observation led by Peter Cable yeah. in 2015. So um, they find that actually a large a sample of um, line and break galaxies at rest, above pressure five. They actually lie systematic below this canonical relationship that that's they call the IRX deficit. So people are not very clear why uh, they so much uh, there's so much offset from that. So that challenged our uh, understanding of this attenuation law. So whether we can apply a universal uh, IRXB relationship to estimate IR luminosity is uh, is a big question. Now. So our goal is basically to understand well, like wh uh, what's this relationship. So uh, I guess a lot of you, when you uh, deal with a physics problem, you, you probably want to boil the, the, the real physics problem down to a simplified toy model, um, um, which gives you the insights, but also, uh, also simplified um, a, a things uh, to, to a certain level. So I myself uh, did the same thing. So I was thinking, what if a complex galaxy is as simple as a 1D dust slab? Now, uh, just imagine there's a fixed stellar population and um, there's a homogeneous dust slab intervening between the fixed stellar population and, and observer. And what can be the IRXB relationship that will be? And I um, derived essentially the, the solution um, and how it depends on different the galaxy, uh, stellar and dust properties. And since throughout, throughout the derivation, there are essentially two main equations that are important. One is the energy balance, is the equation one. It gives you the relationship between the infrared axis and the, and the, and the tau, the, the, the optical depth. And so you see that it follows an exp exponential law. And second uh, relationship is the color reddening. Here is how much your slope is bent by, by the attenuation. So it actually follows a linear relationship uh, between um, beta and, and tau. Z here is related to the dust property. 
So you immediately can see that, that you can combine equation one and two and remove the tau in both equations in common. You end up with the simple analytic form. Um, if the galaxy is as simple as a 1D dust slab, then this is the relation that you will get. And this um, analytic um, formula contains three parameters. Beta naught corresponds to the stellar property and Z corresponds to the dust. Y parameter is a weak function of, of both stellar and dust properties. I'm going to show you a bit more what this, um, where the y parameter come into the game. So now you have this analytics solutions. Uh, we can see this diagram that gives you, essentially along this direction is the UV optical depth, is the thickness of, of this slab that drives the galaxy, uh, drives the solution along this line. But in the perpendicular direction, there are two things. One is the stellar population and the other one is the dust attenuation property. So they are actually are degenerate. The challenge with observation is actually, it's not very easy to degenerate between stars and uh, in a dust. So for a young stellar population, you shift the relationship left hand to left hand side and for older shift to the right hand side. Uh, when you change uh, the dust properties, you question? not only, yes. Uh, mind if I ask a few naive questions? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, no yeah. Problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So, so for the the dust, are these um, yes. for galaxies? Yeah, I'm I'm not a galaxy person. Are yes. dust is dust in galaxies typically optically thin or thick? Uh, it depends on which band pass you're uh, looking at. For instance, okay. if you're looking at UV, then it's optical thick. But okay. if you're in, uh, um, talking about infrared, you see this how there's a power law decline in the opacity curve. So mm -hmm. when you talk about UV, it's it's usually opaque. But when you talk about infrared or submillimeter, it's optical thin. Okay, yes. and then and then this uh, beta parameter on the left-hand plot is this directly related to the optical depth through the above equation, or am I missing? Oh something? yes, yes, okay. it's actually so. So basically, um, equation two gives you the relationship between like the the color you observe beta and and the optical depth. So the more you attenuate, of course, the le uh, the, the galaxy will appear to be redder. That's what this equation means. Okay, cool, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, sure. So um, now you can see that uh, when I change a dust model, for instance, I replace like a Milky Way by a SMC, SMC dust. Um, it not only shifts the curve, your solution horizontally, but also it changed the shape of the solution. It becomes more shallow. That's only because like the, uh, the kappa, the opacity um, at this um, band, within this band that observers use to measure beta, uh, they have different shape uh, when you change the dust model. So this is um, well established. So before I talk um, a bit more in, into the simulation, from the simulation side, I want to first think, uh, uh, want everyone to think about this, like what, what are the differences between a galaxy and a, a real galaxy and a simplified 1D dust model? And what are the similarities between the two? So as for the differences, there are actually two. The first, the definition of, of the optical depth is different. It's no longer a simple column depth of, of the slab. Uh, because you can imagine some of the stars, they live in the highly obscured regions, and some are totally unobscured. So the, uh, the, 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 result, the, the resulting tau is actually an effective quantity. Um, so there are actually two things that can matter. One is the total amount of dust. And or the second is a spatial configuration of the dust geometry, which is more important for determining the tau. This is the most important question. And second difference between a toy model and a real galaxy is the distribution of stellar age within a galaxy. We know that some of the stars, some young stars and old stars, they have different distribution within a galaxy. galaxy this. And for, um, uh, if we think about this in the other direct dimension, um, the, um, as the galaxy evolves um, as a function of time, like because of the environmental, it has in interaction with the environments. So the stellar population will change from time to time. So these are the two main differences that a simple dust 1D slab model does not well account for. So that's why we need to use a simulation. Otherwise, like it's solve everything analytically and it's, it's enough. But um, because of these differences, major differences, we have to, Ask for help from, from a simulation. So I myself like a play with the fire simulation uh, for the past few years. So um, specifically, I actually focus on the massive end because these are the luminous objects that the, the candidates that can be luminous and directly comparable to, to, to the observations that we have. So um, this, um, so I, I believe that uh, in fi fire simulation, we, we now have like much higher resolution, but the, um, the simulation that I, that I play with like have a standard, um, have a 
resolution of a uh, typical resolution of like a 10, 10 parsec. Um, like compared to like a mass at that regime is actually a pretty good resolution already. Of course, um, as you know, that fire is actually a cosmological zoom means that um, it simulates a patch uh, in the simulation whole cosmological volume. Um, um, it includes a galaxy as well as a neighborhood. So um, it um, involves the realistic merging and the uh, baryonic cycling cycling processes that help us to reproduce the st realistic star formation history. And of course, um, um, as you may know that uh, a fire is different, probably different, different from, from other, uh, some other simulations is that it explicitly model like uh, various feedback processes um, without um, introducing too much like a, um, free parameters. Now, okay, so I'm not going to too much into the detail, but I want to highlight two bullet points here. So here, the spatial resolution actually corresponds to the difference I, I just mentioned between a toy model and the, and the real galaxy. Um, the spatial distribution of dust in the star is actually very important when you when you do the RT processes. Um, that that's actually um, that's that's something we it's not well captured by a toy model. And second condition actually corresponds to the difference p that I just mentioned before because of these realistic environmental conditions, you have those meta exchange and energy exchange with the environment so that you can reproduce a more realistic star formation history. And these properties has been well tested before by a series of fire papers. Now, okay, so um, so having those uh, simulations, we, we want to have the tool to do the RT, right? So so the tool I, I've been using is, 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 is called SKIRT. There are also like other tools like Sunrise um, uh, in the market, actually a lot of like a RT, but for, for, for Galaxy. For the purpose of, of galaxy research, actually SKIRT is getting more and more popular. Uh, thanks for the development and maintenance for, for, for the SKIRT team, of course. Um, so with um, the RT tool, then uh, we can actually reproduce the multi-wave fed data products and, uh, and do what, uh, um, what observations do. And, uh, and so we can reproduce um, mock images of the galaxies, as well as the multi, uh, th those properties like IR luminosity, UV luminosity, and beta. This is something we can, we can, we can make a meaningful comparison to the observation now. So what's interesting is that you can see that this is the uh, result that we get from the fire simulation. It does show like certain level of scatter, especially those like uh, objects that lie systematic below. Now, of course, we want to know like why, where, what is the physical origin of this? Uh, of this large scatter. Now, after talking about the differences, I want to um, mention now let's come to like the similarities. Uh, the similarities actually you have to go, come back, uh, come back to, 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 to the mathematical formula. So the, the two, looking at these two fundamental equations, one is the energy balance equation and the other one is the, the, uh, the color redden. And you compare the results, uh, the simulation result with analytic solution that you can solve from a 1D dust slab model. And then actually you, you find pretty good similarities. On left hand side, you see that, that when those data points are angle average result, when these properties are angle average, and the IRX and the effective tau of the galaxy strictly follow a exponential law, law as predicted by the 1D toy model. Uh, here, this black line is the reference, it's a baseline relationship where I use y equals to one. And essentially, the di discrepancy between the data points um, to this baseline relationship gives you the value of y. Now on the right right hand side, um, I, I said like the color that you measure uh, as UV slope, it has a linear relationship with tau, but you actually don't see any linear rela relation here on the right hand side. Now, the reason of course is there's a uh, variation of intrinsic color of galaxies. So when you move, for instance, um, this tau beta naught to the left hand side of the equation, um, which you can do to this figure, uh, you subtract beta, apparent beta that you measure by the intrinsic beta, then you find that the linearity like emerge. And it actually follows the analytic results that you predict from a, a slab model very well. And the scatter in this relationship actually comes from the complex dust to start geometry that is not captured. Well, I want to uh, highlight is that observations, now that observations find more uh, evidence that some of the high ratio of galaxies, they're UV emitting regions and IR emitting regions are at have far offsets, like a kiloparsec away from each other. Uh, that means that the, um, the dust distribution in those galaxies might be very inhomogeneous. So um, what I want to look at is actually the scatter. Uh, at, at those galaxies are supposed to have a um, attenuation law, which is quite different from the intrinsic extinction law. 
which is due to the complex uh, dust to star geometry. And I expect them to have a large scatter from here. So when you change, uh, replace your uh, dust model, like oh, from a Milky Way like dust to SMC dust, uh, still like this uh, analytic model works. You um, subtract one by the other. So the discrepancy between the two predictions using two different dust models, find that actually the discrepancy follows a linear relationship uh, with how this is also predicted. When people talk about um, galaxy color, they always say, uh, tell you that SMC dust will result in a redder galaxy. And the re reason is here. There's a um, linear relationship here. And it's well uh, predicted by the 1D dust set model. OK, so can I, can um, I ask a question? Yes. I think you alluded to it in the previous diagram of the opacity law. But uh, yes. how, how important is it uh, distinguishing between the absorption and the scattering part of the extinction? Um, um, you're asking about the dust of a beetle. So it's actually well, and scattering is. And, yes. fa and phase function. I mean, do you follow that in your calculations in this skirt? Uh, yes, business? yes. Yeah. Yes, um, it includes both scattering and the absorption processes. And it has a um, opacity for, for absorption as well as um, scattering. Um, the scattering, so a beetle, actually, I checked that. So it's a ratio of the scattering um, over like the overall. So it's actually increased. As you go to longer wavelengths, actually uh, scattering becomes more and more important. Uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Uh, so these results are produ produced like uh, after taking into account both absorption and scattering processes. Okay, well, but there's one more thing in the scattering. It's, it's, yes. it's the angular direction of the scattering, which is the oh, yes, yes. phase function. So I'm just yes, saying yes. it's that, and that produces an effect of uh, tau, or or you can calculate it accurately. Uh, yes, if you know the size distribution uh, that goes with those curves uh, through skirt. Yes, yeah. yes, it will change. Uh, scattering will definitely change the um, shape of the attenuation curve. Um, it will make the curve look steeper, and um, that's what I explicitly find uh, with the fire simulation and with skirt. Um, so the physics is that they are actually photons scatter back into the cameras. Yeah, yeah. So that's why um, um, if the uh, albedo is increased with wavelength, so at longer wavelength, there's a larger chance that photos get into scatter back into the camera. Uh, I would say like it accounts for like well, it's, it's, it depends on the system. Uh, at most, I think I checked that at most it accounts for twenty percent of uh, of the UV light. That's, that you um, receive in the camera is from the light that is scattered back. It depends on the viewing angle, like from the edge on and the face on direction, um, actually the chance of scattering back is actually different. I'm actually going, going to show you this. In, in okay. A, okay, yeah, in my thank, next you. Slide. thank you. I don't want yes. to take any more of your time. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, yeah, so, um, so after like uh, we, uh, after like talking about, so after talking about the right-hand side, so we can move back to the, to the left-hand side. So now um, you can see like oh, previously I've been showing the angle average result, but then what if you show the result from 24 random viewing directions and each data, each color corresponds to a same galaxy. So these are the results from the same galaxy. And there's something interesting is that you'll find that actually when you're talking about individual galaxy, the relationship does not follow the universal one, the best fit result for, for, the, for, the, for the galaxy sample. And uh, I've, I've said that this is related to Y parameter and the Y is related to both like stellar and dust properties. Now for this case, when you change the viewing angle, you do not change the stellar properties. It has nothing to do with the star. The only thing you change is the location of dust relative to, to the stars. And the fact that those, um, relation becomes shadow when you're looking at the galaxy from different viewing angle tells you a universal result, which is that the um, attenuation curve is shallower in direction of higher tau, regardless of morphology, because this sample of the fire galaxy includes uh, um, dispersions, uh, more dispersion-like galaxy, as well as the um, disk-like galaxies. So they have complete different morphologies. But on this diagram, you seem 
up here, it seems like they have this universal uh, relationship um, at different viewing angle. So it tells us actually the, there's a universal law that attenuation is shallower uh, when you have a high, high, uh, in the direction of high tau. So observation, they actually evidence before, like in the past few years, there are different papers actually show the result. Um, what they did is that they have a sample of disk galaxies and they look at the disk galaxy from edge on and the face on direction. Uh, they'll find that actually on the average, the disk, uh, the face on and the edge on direct uh, galaxies, they have different uh, location distribution on the IRXP relation. So th th um, this actually indicates that um, the shape of the attenuation law depends on which direction you are, you are viewing. And actually what the observers have reported is actually the tip of the iceberg. So because, I mean, um, um, this galaxy is the easiest for us to, to, to distinguish the direction of high tau and direction of low tau. But what I'm trying to um, convince people is that there are actually a bottom part of the iceberg here is actually, this actually is a universal law. It's not limited to the, to the disk galaxy itself, but this relationship actually is common uh, even for, for elliptical or, or, or irregular galaxies. But I myself haven't actually been able to manage to derive analytically why, uh, where this slope comes from, but I just felt, felt like it's pretty interesting. Okay, so one thing that I need to mention is that um, if we, we probably can go a bit deeper into this relationship. So when we talk about SMC and the Milky Way dust, actually we change the Z here. So Z is a microscopic quantity and tau is a macroscopic scale quantity that has something to do with the spatial distribution on the large scale. So this equation actually links the microscopic quantity to the microscopic quantity. And what it means is that a small difference on the mac microscopic level can be amplified by the physical condition on the macroscopic scale. And the end product is the color that you see from, um, well, from a galaxy. Okay, so now let's talk about simulations. So from, in the simulations, we find that um, actually the uh, most important um, mechanism that drives the scatter, the deviation from the standard relationship is related to the star formation history on this time scale of 100 million years. So when you average this over like 1 billion years, a longer time scale, actually the correlation is actually not that large. So it's actually very sensitive to, to a 100 million year time scale. And that actually also triggers a question. So, um, because we know that different simulations have different predictions for, for the star forming history on this time scale. So it will be very actually interesting to, to find a different simulation suit and compare the level of scatter or whether, whether there is how much different the result will be compared to the five simulations. But anyway, so um, I, we find that actually it's, it's, it's the major uh, reason uh, that's why a galaxy can, because they have different, very different recent star formation history. So now like, can, we can move back to the, to, the, to the crisis. The first is the Eulers. Now it's, um, I think it's easier to understand. Those Eulers are very compact objects. And so they have a very high effective optical depth. And that's why their IRX the, is, is that high. It's way above the, um, the canonical M99 relationship. And at the same time, they have a recent star bath. So their intrinsic beta is very, intrinsic color is very blue. And so that's why they, they, they lie up here. Now, the other uh, crisis is from the k objects. They are Russia fire objects. And they, uh, if you say that they are, they are this, they have all stellar population, that sounds very strange because when we look at Russia five, it's very um, unlikely that we preferentially select those recently quenched objects. But there must be other reason. And one um, um, assumption, so suspicion is that they have very SMC, very steep, attenuation law. So that can bring these objects back to. So I'm going to tell you that this may not be the uh, may not be the reason. So before we move on to the next part of, of, of my talk, I want to do a recap, quick recap of the IRSP. Um, so um, yes. Um, so the most important thing is that actually it's highly uncertain we, whether we should apply a universal relationship to correct dust obscure SFR. And second is that um, the prediction from a dust set model actually um, is pretty good when it comes to the real system. So if effective UV optical depth essentially is the key driver that move the galaxy along this relationship and in a perpendicular direction, they are stellar and the dust properties and they are degenerate with each other. For the observations, it's challenging to disentangle these two effects. And for fire, we find that actually the star formation history within the time scale of 100 million years uh, is the key factor for, for, for driving the scatter in this relationship. And there's a universal law 
that the dust attenuation curve becomes shallower and we have observational, plenty of observational evidence to support our finding. So, okay, so uh, let's move on to the second part. I'm sorry, I'm taking a bit long, but um, yes. Uh, so um, many of you ha might have like um, noticed that I've been talking about intrinsic scatter in this relationship for a long time. But the problem is that uh, also observational uncertainty. Uh, so th that means that uh, the physical property that, that we measure from observation, uh, can we trust them? So through, uh, um, so I actually um, my feeling, personal feeling is that both beta and IRX can actually be uncertain when, when you measure things. But I'm going to focus a bit more on IRX because um, it, I think it's very important in theory, but I skip the discussion on beta. But let's come back to the PayPal objects. So we know that they actually lie way above the M99 relationship. So many people would argue that uh, the dust attenuation law at high redshift is more SMC-like than local universe. That's, uh, that can solve the problem. The alternative way is to assume that they have a much higher dust temperature uh, than the local objects. And that can bring these objects back to the normal relationship. I'm going to talk in a few slides like why this problem is related to dust temperature. Okay, so this is actually the uh, most standard, the simplified uh, SED shape uh, of dust thermal emission, so which we call modified, uh, mod modified black body equation. It looks like the Stephen Bosman law of a, of a black body radiation, but because dust is uh, most often optical thing at far infrared. So the equation is uh, different from a Stephen Bosman. Um, here you have this beta extra term, uh, which is the power index in the dust capacity curve. This is a different beta than compared to the beta I've been talking about in the past 30 minutes. Okay. So on the Rayleigh James tail, so the submillimeter density is linearly scaled to the mass and the temperature. So that means that when you double the temperature, you double the flux density uh, in this tail. Uh, the way inside is different. This is super linear region. So I'm talking about the, the linear region. So when you, you can immediately see from those two equations that you can combine these two, one divided by the other, and you get the, uh, the luminosity to set the flux density ratio is proportional to the T, the temperature. So, um, so imagine that when you have a fixed IR luminosity, when your dust temperature is high, then you should expect this, um, the flux density in the Rayleigh James scale should be lower. Uh, this is an illustration from Casey Caitlin in um, 2018 um, that uh, all these curves show the, are, are the SED templates. They all correspond to the same IR, total IR luminosity. But these orange curves have a higher dust temperature. So when you measure the flux density with AMA and you do expect lower uh, flux density. So actually that provides a very natural explanation. I think um, so a lot of people would have argued that um, a higher Dust temperature um, should be expected a higher redshift. But I've been trying to um, um, bring something new to uh, to this explanation because I was thinking um, that there, there's something that is important that might be missing uh, in this explanation. And uh, to, to, in order to find like what, what, what is missing, so we we're gonna have to come back to the three equations. And we we can gaze at the three equations for one minute, and we'll probably find where 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 could be the problem. Now I I can. Um, because we don't have enough time, I directly tell the answer. Um, my answer, uh, I think, is that the t the problem is t parameter in the first equation and t parameter in the second equation are actually not the same t parameter. The first um, is what I call the equivalent dust temperature. It should be, uh, I think, is is more or less like an unphysical temperature and should be viewed as the overall as a proxy for the overall light to dust mass ratio of the galaxy. And the second one is the mass weighted temperature. So I'm talking about a galaxy, okay? So, so this is different from, from, from a toy model. So the second is actually the mass weighted the temperature. This is the um, physical temperature of the majority of the mass in the interstellar medium. So the problem is that those T, the, T temp the two temperatures in the two equations are actually not the same temperatures. And the typically the first one is, is higher. And the problem is that they don't have a strong correlation. And if like the equivalent temperature is always higher by a factor of two or three, there's no problem. Um, so the problem is that they have no relationship. And observationally through SED fitting, we more or less get the temperature that's similar or correlated with the equivalent dust temperature, but not the mass weighted temperature because observationally it's very challenging since we do not resolve individual star forming clusters at high redshift. So um, that's the problem. So probably that um, this statement is not 
uh, valid, we cannot simply combine these two equations because those two t parameters in the equation are actually not the same temperature. So we did a thorough study on the SED shape at high rest using the fire simulations. So um, these are actually showing uh, the black line is the SED of a uh, produced SED, and these colored lines are different templates that have been observed to derive the IR luminosity. So we find that actually to, in order to recover the right IR luminosity, you're gonna to have to assume a very high dust temperature norm, uh, typically at high ratio, like 60, 70, that's very normal. But the physical temperature, the mass weighted temperature actually can be as low as 30 or even uh, closer, cl close to the CMB temperature. So, um, so the problem is, um, is actually, um, how can we get this mass weighted temperature? Um, so um, it's actually currently it's actually pretty challenging, but um, but the key is that um, there's a fundamental assumption that everybody I think I think uh, we should keep in mind is that this equivalent temperature that we normally use to derive the IR luminosity depends on a fundamental assumption, which is that we know the SED shape at high ratio very well. Uh, if this fundamental assumption does not work, then the physical temp the temperature that you assigned to the SED template that you use lose its physical meaning. Uh, that's my, my argument. So uh, this probably uh, is an important thing because uh, normally this is uh, equivalent temperature is what we think is the physical temperature of high ratio galaxy, but actually uh, it's not. So in order to account for the variation, the true SD shape at high ratio, I think it's, uh, it's very important that we have a, a two-phase picture. Like this is, I'm, I'm showing the local observation from the Herschel telescope of a star forming clouds in the nearby universe. And you'll find that from, from the observations um, where we have resolved like individual clouds uh, because it's within the Milky Way, actually only a limited amount of the dust is heated to high temperature. The majority of the dust is cold and does not seem to know anything about the detailed conditions near the star forming regions. And there are actually also indirect evidence like when we move out of the Milky Way and uh, focus on ratio zero and two, what we can do is that we stack those SED from the different galaxy. Or oh, this is the Reshop regime. We have a full coverage from Spitzer, Herschel, Stuber, and Arma. So here we have a good, a well, well, a good knowledge of the SED shape of individual galaxies. So, so we can stack them together and renormalize the SED to a single data point. We find that the shape at the long wavelength is, looks identical and variation happens at mid infrared. So that is actually the indirect evidence because at it, at, uh, at outside Milky Way, we actually do, do not resolve individual power as within the Milky Way. So it's actually not direct observation, but indirect observation. So from this indirect um, evidence, we, um, it actually motivates or give us the observational motivation that we have to propose a two-phase picture to have one warm dust component that associated with the, with the young star forming regions, which is tied to this mid infrared component of the SED as well as uh, a cold dust component that is, um, that is uh, associated to the long wavelength part. So I, I, I've said that uh, probably uh, a high ratio of galaxy have warmer dust temperature may not necessarily be correct. And what is the difference between the low Z and the high Z? So I think the problem um, so is that uh, at high ratio of galaxies are more active at forming stars. And because of rise, the main sequence of star forming main sequence rise as a function of pressure. So at high ratio, we expect um, the galaxy to have more of those warm star forming clouds that is in close vicinity to the, to the young stars. So that actually uh, means that um, at high ratio, a larger mass fraction of the dust are able to see the UV light uh, emitted from the young stars. That effectively boosts the mid infrared component of the SC uh, overall far infrared SCD. So when we, uh, recover IR luminosity, we normally have to assume a very high equivalent dust temperature to get the right IR luminosity. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the, major the dust, the physical temperature of dust is, is necessarily colder, is necessarily harder at higher ratio. So that is um, thing, the, the model that I think, uh, I propose. So of course, um, there's um, like the two-phase picture does not came out of the blue and actually have underlying physics there. So imagine we have a uh, stars embedded in the dust cloud and we have the primary UV photons emitted from the stars and those uh, primary UV photons can effectively heat the dust in, in close vicinity. And then the, since the dust gets heated, it re-emit as far infrared and becomes the secondary uh, far infrared photons. And we can define a characteristic radius 
uh, which is essentially the location or the UV photon stops. And it gives you the location where the tau UV uh, equals to one. So this is the characteristic radius. So in that sense, we can redefine hot dust and the cold dust because normally we, when we talk about hot dust, this means that the temperature is hot and cold dust means the temperature is cold. Um, we can think about this in a different way, which is in the direction of opacity. Like hot dust should be redefined as the dust component enclosed within this characteristic radius, while cold dust is those, the dust component enclosed, be, uh, locates beyond this radius. And so um, with this picture in mind, we can now understand why the heating of the ISM dust can be that inefficient is because um, as the photons uh, become like secondary, uh, through the absorption re-emission process becomes secondary photons, becomes less energetic. And um, um, the second effect is related to the opacity curve as we know that it has a power of decline. So you can imagine when a photon um, change from a primary UV to, to a secondary IR photons, then the chance of absorbing the secondary photon is much lower because the power of decline in the opacity curve. So there are actually a combination of two factors that, that results in an ineffective, inefficient heating uh, of dust in the ISM. So I've been talking about like um, um, the high galaxy. So I have proposed a toy model where I argue that actually um, high um, rest of galaxy have a more young, uh, those warm dust components. You can imagine that it's more or less like a pizza at high rest of you have more toppings. Um, if it is a Hawaiian pizza, then you have more piece of pineapples there. Uh, you have a better pizza there. But actually, I, I realized that actually that's not the complete version of the story. So actually there are some follow-up studies. Uh, they do it in an analytic way. Um, and I think the main goal is to resolve the physical regime that is not necessarily resolved in the cosmological simulations. So their arguments, so the, the follow-up studies focus on each single piece of pineapple, not like the galaxy, the piece, whole piece of, as a whole. So they, they, they actually think about this in this way. So what if I make the cloud more compact because we know that the ISM at high redshift is more pressurized. So if I, for instance, I don't change the stars or dust mass, but I simply make it more compact. So again, I want to calculate where the UV photon stops. So I want to calculate what is the characteristic radius. And this is a function of rho times L. So you'll find that because this term M over R squared increase because I make a compact and make them all dense. And the UV photon stops as a smaller fraction of total radius of this cloud. So that means that the same amount of energy emitted from the stars is absorbed and re-emitted by a less amount of dust mass. And that can make the SEE shape looks warmer as well. So there actually could be two possible mechanisms. And one is you have a better pizza at a high ratio. And the second is that for each individual cloud, there might be on a time average sense, because you have to consider the dispersion, the dispersal time scale of the cloud. Uh, on the time average sense, because the ISM is more pressurized at high ratio. So making it more compact will result in a warmer dust and CD shape. So this may be the complete ver uh, version of the story. So now um, the result is that if you want to estimate the right IR luminosity of high ratio galaxy, so we recommend uh, from, the, from the simulation, we find that actually uh, we do need a higher equivalent dust temperature to, to estimate the right IR. And then we give a power law. So if we use a constant dust temperature to extrapolate IR luminosity all the time, and we will systematically underestimate the IRX of those high ratio. But there are also secondary dependency, even consider this ratio dependence, a fixed ratio and the scatter in the IRX is actually pretty, still pretty large. That has something to do with the detailed conditions of the star forming clouds, because it's very significant system by system. And we find that actually there's actually additional uh, correlation to tau, the UV optical depth. Um, this has to, uh, th this sounds very strange because you know, IRX essentially is a shape of the far infrared and tau is optical depth at UV. So what this diagram means that the shape of galaxies SED at far infrared knows its UV optical depth. And that sounds very weird. It sounds like, uh, mass of the black hole knows the velocity dispersion of the stars nearby and how do black hole and stars talk to each other, right? So the reason, of course, because there, um, tau, there's, this is a direction of more pineapples um, because more compact objects, they are more active forming stars. So high tau, this is a um, direction of more active uh, star forming region. And at the same time, uh, because when you make the, uh, the second effect is making the cloud more compact. 
So when you make it more compact, you actually can increase optical depth as well. So the reason I keep using uh, UV optical depth as additional um, matrix to find additional um, correlation to IRX is that I think UV optical depth can capture both poses that uh, it's a direction of the soft formation activity. And at the same time, it capture the fact that making the cloud compact will leads to a warmer dust SCD shape as well. So I think uh, that's a summary of, of the dust temperature problem. Um, so, um, so I would recommend um, using the term of warmer SCD shape instead of a physical warmer dust temperature. So we did, uh, we did argue that high redshift galaxies have warmer SCD shape, but that's not necessarily means uh, that they are physically uh, harder at high redshift. And to, in order to account for the variation of, of SCD shape between different galaxies, it's better, uh, it will be more useful that we have a two-phase picture um, of interstellar dust in mind. And I think uh, I, maybe I just spent a few more minutes talking about a small application. And when we are uh, looking into the simulation and we uh, see the 2D uh, projection of molecular gas and the submillimeter flux, actually their 2D imaging looks quite similar. Uh, they, they, they seem to overlap each other very well. And this actually because uh, when we write submillimeter flux density um, as a function of M and T, we can divide it by the uh, molecular gas mass and then um, um, through um, a little bit math, we, we find that actually this conversion factor, the flux density over the molecular gas mass is proportional to this dust gas ratio and the mass weighted temperature because we are looking at things at the long enough wavelength. So now it's dominated by the cold dust component. So what if like dust gas ratio and the mass weighted temperature are quite similar uh, at high ratio? Then that means this conversion factor is actually has a relatively small uh, scatter. Um, so if, for instance, these two does not vary significantly system by system, then as long as we measure the submillimeter flux, we can have a good constraint on the molecular gas mass of high ratio galaxy. That actually has uh, already been done by um, this actually uh, observation led by Nick Scoville uh, in 20, 20, uh, five years ago. So the, the result is that the submillimeter flux density and over the one zero, the baseline of the CO emission, the ratio is actually as small as a factor of two across like five order of magnitude of galaxy luminosities. Uh, that's very um, striking because um, compared to alpha CO, um, that conversion factor of CO luminosity to molecular gas mass, uh, this effect of two scatter is relatively small. And because measuring or uh, getting the submillimeter broadband flux is much more faster than measuring CO line spectroscopy. So it actually can pro provide a promising approach for constraining molecular gas mass at high redshift in a very efficient way. And this actually has been proved by uh, at least two group of simulations. Um, we did uh, with FIRE and also other uh, groups with SIMBA uh, also have proved that actually from, from in the simulation, we do find that submillimeter flux is a good uh, tracer of the molecular gas mass. So that gives us a promising uh, new approach to, uh, to constrain large sample of galaxy, uh, their gas mass uh, at high redshift. Uh, so I think uh, that's it. I'm taking too long. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. Um, questions for Lei yes. Chen? So Lei Chen, you mentioned ULERGs. Yes. Which Nick, Nick has worked on a lot of course in the past. Yes. Um, Right, so the, the original variation in alpha CO was probably due to users like, like RP20, where you had, if you used a yes. standard conversion, you had more gas than you had mass at a given radius. Yes. And I don't remember, has anybody looked at the Euler gas to dust ratio the same way up to now? Um, and the reason I ask is, right, because the ULIGs yes. are really, really compact, right? Like RP20, the yes. half the flux comes out of about 100 parsecs. Yes. So I'd imagine there are the conditions, there isn't any two phase medium in there. All the dust grains and all the mass and all the gas, they're, they're, they're all at quite a high temperature, but you could still, I yes. think, get the same gas to dust ratio if you go to long enough wavelengths, of course, which is what your point was. So I'm just wondering, has, yes. has anybody actually tried to do that to, to get out a gas mass for our pre-20 or um, some ULERGs? 
Well, I actually, um, oh, that's a good question, actually. I'm actually not sure. <laughs> of, um, observation, well, I do feel like, so um, when people like um, use the CO emission, they, um, not, they not think that it's actually more reliable to use one zero phase transition because at high ratio, um, you more or less get, get the hydrate transition. And um, the transfer from hydrate data to baseline is actually pretty uncertain. The large uncertainty origins from that ladder. Um, so when Nick Scoville was doing that observations, it's actually, uh, they only use one zero transition data. Um, and, and they think that the CO is more reliable. Than the, than the you, dust than, emission? But dust, I, I, would, I would expect personally, in fact, dust is actually reliable because I'm, although um, it's very starburst, but the optical depth is actually very high because you learn the sophomore region is more compact. So you would expect the optical depth. So dust is more easily to, to be shielded from the, from the UV heating. Yeah, but it's not shielded from this. See, they're, they're so optically thick that the IR photons can't get, get out either. Right, there's the optical depth even, it's bigger than one even at like uh, two or 300 microns, I think. So they're bathed in this very strong yes, radiation yes. field. So they're gonna act differently yes. than high ridge galaxies, which don't have those kinds of huge optical depths. Yes, yes. So you're gonna have to measure things at long enough uh, wavelength because um, yes, um, Euler actually is optical thick until like 200 micron. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we have to measure things at long Beyond enough wavelength. There. Yes, yes. Might be worth following up. I had a question about the uh, mm -hmm. apparent shape of the SED from which you get your SED temperature. Yes, yes. Uh, and that, that's a good slide to show, the one that had the SED on it. Uh, yes. Uh, not that one, but the more cartoonish one that had the, that showed the, that one, the one that showed the variability in the mid-infrared. Oh, yes, yes. No, not that one. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'll just say it in the uh, Oh, this one. That one, yeah. So yes, okay. that large variation that in the mid-infrared, especially yes. in, in the short wavelength part in yes. the Milky Way, uh, yes. is understood as non-equilibrium emission. And that requires yes. uh, small grains far away from UV, where the UV, where the medium is uh, porous so that the UV can get to it and uh, raise the temperature to a value, well, the SED temperature to a value higher than the actual equilibrium temperature for large grains. Okay, so that's mm -hmm. a long way of saying yes. uh, you have a two-phase model, but is there a third phase where you have to include the effect of non-equilibrium emission? Well, in the simulations, I do include um, uh, non-equilibrium. So in, in skirt, actually, it does account for the non-equilibrium. For a small grain, the collision frequency is not high enough. So um, it's more difficult to reach some equilibrium. Um, it actually impacts the shape of um, at, mitten, at rest mid infrared, uh, but has nothing to do with the long wave there. Um, no, no, for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, See, but I would so, guess in the so to Peter's point, right? The spatial yes. resolution, even in fire, is not good enough to get the holes that you actually see. Well, in exactly. Milky Way. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So it's not as so porous that's as the real Milky Way. Yeah. Okay. Yes. yes. Well, well, yeah. In situations like in your first phase, where you're really mm -hmm. close to the UV, mm -hmm. then the equilibrium is temperature is so high that the non-equilibrium emission doesn't really stick out very much. It's only, it only sticks out when the grains ordinarily would be cold. If you just thought they were in thermal equilibrium, but the small grains aren't, as you know. Yes. Well, um, yes. I, well, I use like two phases instead of three phases because to simplify things. Of course, <laughs> in real life, it's like, 
it's, it's, it's a continuous thing. So I yeah. can propose like three phase, five phase, but to make it sound more like a paper written by a theorist. So I, <laughs> I can explain things using a two phase. I wouldn't use a three phase. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I suggest we move to the after seminar discussion. Uh, could I just ask a quick question? Uh, uh, so, um, the two temperature model is, of course, something that people have been interested in for um, modeling the CIB. And yes. uh, as we've indicated, has been indicated, it depends upon the UV environment as well as many other things. So, uh, two is probably actually a spectrum. Uh, I was pleased to see that you have lambda minus two multiplying the models at long wavelength, which is mm -hmm. what physics sort of gives you. <laughs> so um, you know that phenomenologically, essentially everybody does this uh, variable alpha index, but single temperature. And so um, do you think that this is the right uh, model to be used. I mean, the the model with two temperatures is that a good model to use for um, the CIB? Uh, you mean that people think that the SCD can be well described by a two temperature? Well, no. It, it actually, it, interestingly enough, uh, it mm -hmm. hasn't been explored as much as it should have been in history, and uh, mm -hmm. there has been some recent ones. I think um, Hensley and others have been doing it for the uh, few temperature approach. It's logical to have done two temperature approach, uh, but you know, mostly they used uh, uh, lambda to the minus alpha times a single temperature. Anyway, I was just wondering oh, yes, yes. If the impact um, of this you, you think is important for us to be dealing with in the CIB. Um, well, I, I would say that two temperature, because I fit the SED that I produce from my fire simulation by the by the two temperature templates as well. It actually can can provide a very good fit to the to the photometric data point from from the simulation produced from the simulation. But the problem is like um, what does the temperature mean when we do the two component fitting? Uh, it's actually still very different from from the physical temperature right. uh, in the galaxy. Um, so I would say like it might be a good strategy for giving you a quite realistic SED shape, but it gives us limited information on the physical temperature um, of dust. Yeah, because in some sense, it's a complicated average yes. of the temperature that uh, is uh, forcing it to have a specific form, but with only one fixed parameter, which is the warmer uh, dust temperature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with all of that, but it's something that one would like the modeling of the CIB to move towards to be more realistic. And in fact, an interesting question is whether one could actually model a spectrum of temperature by some kind of, uh, of uh, <clears throat> I don't know, splining or something, you know, really maybe coarse grain, but more than just uh, uh, even a two temperature model. Anyway. Thank <laughs> you. 